Hi, it's Kathy, dietitian with the Highland Primary Care Network, and today I'm going to present to you getting started with nutrition. Um, we would love to have you here in our boardroom, but sending as we can't get together right now, uh, we hope this YouTube video will help for the meantime. Take care. What is the Highland Primary Care Network? Uh, the Highland Primary Care Network is a group of healthcare professionals whose aim is to support the doctors from Airdrie out to Didsbury. So if you doctor um, from Airdrie out to Didsbury, then your doctor has a nurse and social worker attached. And all throughout this pandemic, you have access to your nurse and your social worker by phone visit. And all you need to do is contact your medical home or doctor's office. We do have a number of other healthcare professionals associated with the Highland Primary Care Network. So our exercise specialist or kinesiologist, uh, myself, the dietitian and our pharmacist, as well as having a number of specialty clinics that normally run out of the Highland Primary Care Network. This class is one of many in the health improvement program and the health improvement program is designed to help you uncover the healthiest uh, version of yourself and um, it is a series of classes and we're working really hard to get them all available virtually and out to you as soon as possible. What we'll talk about today. So I hope to go over the major components of food, the importance of um, staying hydrated or getting water in, uh, just some really basic healthy eating information and uh, talking a little bit about balanced meals and serving sizes. And nutrition is one of those subjects where um, sometimes you can't give a really black and white answer because it all depends on what's going on in the rest of the day. And uh, it's really about balance. And um, I think that's a helpful way to look about nutrition too, um, to move away from the idea that there's bad foods and good foods, but really that it's all about living in balance. Um, so just thinking about that as we move on. We will talk a little bit about uh, label reading and serving sizes, and we'll talk about physical activity and exercises and end the day as we often do with our HIP programs with SMART goals. So if you're tuning into this presentation, I can only assume that you have um, motivation to do so, and it may be some of the reasons that are listed here. But something I like, do like to highlight is that healthy eating can be very tasty and it doesn't have to be boring, and we can um, have all the foods we want and really enjoy them. And that's really what we do want when we, when we point to the food guide later, you'll see that one of the messages on there is to enjoy our food. And we know that when people are enjoying their food and tuning in and really um, paying attention to the food they're eating, that sometimes we can be satisfied with a lot less and we can um, really know our body can find balance and really know what how much we need. But of course, all these other reasons listed here are other good reasons to eat healthy. So reducing our risk of heart attack and stroke, um, help managing blood pressure and diabetes and reducing our risk of cancer. But perhaps the most important reason, we know that the research would state that if we're engaging in our healthy behaviors, such as healthy eating, active living, absence of tobacco and moderate or absence of alcohol, if we're engaging in those four healthy behaviors regularly, that we will get to do the things we want with the people we love for a little longer. And I do believe that that is the best reason to make an investment in our in our health right now uh, by eating healthier and incorporating some some fun and enjoyable movement the major components of food that we'll talk about going on from this slide we'll talk about carbohydrates and there seems to me a lot of a lot of misinformation about carbohydrates. They get a pretty bad rap out there in the world today. So we'll go over that a little bit and see if we can wade through the information. Um, we'll talk a little bit about protein and how what, what are the functions of protein, and we'll do the same with fat. Uh, we'll talk about vitamins and minerals, and then move on to a little bit on water. 
and I talked about, I would show you the food guide a couple of slides ago, and here it is. So we've had this food guide for just over a year. Um, you'll see on the one side that they do use the plate method, which is actually a pretty well-researched way to help people eat healthy without overwhelming uh, overwhelming them with information. And basically the plate method is if you put, if you fill half your plate with veggies, um, whatever's on the other half of the plate um, looks a lot more balanced and healthy. So, um, but really the whole plate method is half your plate with fruits and veggies, and then a quarter of your plate will be the starches, and then a quarter is your protein, which um, this food guide very much uh, focused on plant-based proteins, although the animal proteins are still there. As you can see that there is some, some meat and, and poultry, um, and there's definitely fish there as well, but more than ever before, plant-based proteins were factoring on the new food guide. Um, and I mentioned some of the messages and they are very simple and I think they're that way for a reason because I feel like people get weighed down with nutrition and it can become quite stressful and even though they're quite simple there is quite a bit of research behind them. Uh, so be mindful of our eating habits. So that's just tuning in to what we're eating and really enjoying it and tuning into what our body is telling us. Uh, cooking at home more often. So yeah, it doesn't even really matter what we're cooking at home, but if we tend to be eating at home and cooking at home more often, th those people tend to be healthier. And I mentioned enjoying your food, so tuning in um, and then eating meals with others because there's lots of research to say that if we're eating with others and it doesn't even matter what we're eating, uh, if we're eating with others, we are healthier. So even though there's simple messages, um, it's kind of nice that they're simple because everything in nutrition today seems very complicated and, and conflicts with the other, but these are very basic and easy to follow, I hope. Carbohydrates is a fancy word for foods that turn to sugar when we eat them. And like I said, they do have a bad rap out there in the world, uh, but they do have a lot of functions in the body. They are our main energy source. They do provide some satiety in our diet. Um, they are protein sparing, and I do want to explain that one. So um, the body's preferred nutrient is carbohydrates and when it's not when we don't have any on board if we skip breakfast or if we just don't have any carbs in our meals uh, the body needs to make sugar from something that's the brain's preferred fuel um, and so what it tends to do or what it does is break down the diet books will focus on yes we do break down fat to make up the glucose that we need or the sugar that we need but we also break down our lean muscle mass our protein stores to use as fuel so i like to liken that to ripping down the frame of your house to burn in your fireplace to heat up your home it just it's not efficient and it doesn't make sense and we really want to preserve our lean muscle mass because that boosts our metabolism when our metabolism runs high, we burn more calories just sitting than we would um, when our metabolism is low. So this is a really important function of our carbohydrates. In Canada, they tend to be our biggest source of B vitamins and, uh, and in Canada as well, our biggest source of fiber. So what foods actually are carbohydrates? And this might be part of the reason why they get such a bad rap. So definitely when I think carbohydrates, I do think what people generally think are breads and pastas. Um, I also think of cereals and I also think of lots of the other grains that belong in this uh, category. So things like millet and quinoa and rice, those are all carbohydrates, all the grains. Um, and then I also do think of... Uh, all the fruits tend to have some carbohydrate and some of the vegetables and it tends to be the vegetables we eat most often so things like beets tomatoes carrots they have a little bit of carbohydrate in them and the group that's often overlooked for carbohydrates is uh, the milk group of course milk has lactose which is milk sugar which is a carbohydrate so that also um, is a carbohydrate and our um, beans, uh, dried peas and lentils, they do have carbohydrate in, in them as well. So like I, I did uh, say in the last slide, it is our main uh, energy source and it is the preferred source for the body and brain. 
but there are different kinds and this may be where some of the uh, r rumors have started that there are simple carbohydrates like simple sugars so when i talk about simple sugars those would be like sugar brown sugar honey um, maple syrup jam or jelly those are kind of simple sugars they go into the blood sugar very quickly whereas complex carbohydrates have a bit more fiber attached to them so that would be things like our fruits and our vegetables with carbohydrate um, our whole grains so um, you know whole grain uh, bread or cereal or pasta or whole grain quinoa or millet for example those are all complex carbohydrates and the complex is what we want to focus on a bit more of so we get that fiber in. It's not really important that you know that there's a different kinds of fiber. I think anytime we're adding fiber in, it's helpful to our digestive tract. There's lots of functions of fiber in the body for sure. Um, uh, where you might want to know the difference between the two is if you're having any digestive issues at all, then I, I definitely try to steer people towards the soluble fiber. And that just means that it dissolves in water um, and it forms a gel. And these are in things like psyllium husks. So note that's PSY um, and oats and barley. Uh, we have it in our apples and pears and citrus fruits. And then we do have some soluble fiber in our beans and lentils, but note that beans and lentils also contain the insoluble fiber. So as long as you don't have any digestive problems, I like including fiber from both groups. But if you have a lot of tummy troubles, you may want to focus more towards the soluble because the insoluble, um, it's just a fermentable carbohydrate. Uh, it can create a lot of gas in the gut. And when you're already having stomach troubles, that may um, cause your symptoms to worsen. So insoluble fiber just means it doesn't dissolve in water. Um, it can help prevent constipation, um, which, which improves regularity and regularity will definitely lower the risk of certain cancers, just keeping the bowel stretchy. Um, yeah, and it's found in some vegetables, fruits, in our whole grains, definitely in the wheat bran. And like I said, the beans and lentils. So our soluble fiber has shown to be particularly beneficial when it comes to lowering uh, LDL or the, when you hear LDL cholesterol, think lousy, we want to keep it low. We sometimes call this the bad cholesterol um, and soluble fiber has shown to have some benefit here. Um, it also helps control blood sugar levels, but I would argue that both insoluble and soluble fibers do that. So just a little bit more on fiber, uh, it helps us feel fuller for longer, like we said, and might help with some appetite to control. Um, how much do we need? Uh, generally, the average Canadian gets about 12 to 14 grams a day. And we're I like to get people to shoot for 25 to 35 grams as a as an idea of a benchmark, obviously we're not going to go from 14 to 25 overnight, but we work slowly towards it. And probably the biggest caution I would say around fiber is to go slowly, just add a little bit, make sure you're drinking a lot of water. Definitely if you add too much fiber all at once, it's going to cause some digestive issues and it's not going to feel very nice. You're not going to like me very much. So go really slow um, and make sure you're drinking lots of water. So you can think of fiber like a little scrub brush or sponge going through your body, giving it a cleaning as it goes. And the other really important thing about fiber that we're only just starting to learn a bit more about is that it feeds the bacteria in the lower digestive tract. So the good bacteria. I can't. The technology doesn't let me add this video into our YouTube uh, videos, but I will give you, if, if we will provide the link in the notes below, and if you want to give it a watch, especially um, on the times that are listed here, it's very interesting. The, the video is starting to get a little dated. Unfortunately, the science is taking a long time on the microbiome, but I'll just give you some key points. So when I say microbiome, all I'm referring to 
is the bacteria in the gut. And it's two, three pounds of bacteria, two or three pounds of bacteria. And they have lots of beneficial effects on our health. And just to give you some idea of the scope of the bacteria there, um, where there's um, 10 trillion cells in the human body, there's 100 trillion cells in the gut bacteria alone. So when you look up at the stars in the sky at night, there's actually more cells in your gut bacteria. So we are an ecosystem. And those, if you think about your microbiome, you think about, uh, I like to liken it to soil. Um, and everybody has a different soil and what will grow there. And um, we will have good plants that we want to grow and thrive in there. And we also have some that are more like weeds. Um, and what they found is that when they transplanted um, bacteria from people living into in larger bodies into mice, um, that even though the mice would eat less, they started to gain weight. So this was really a key bit of research that showed us that the microbes actually did something. Um, and they're not just signaling, signaling obesity, they may actually cause it. So the more we can have a, a diverse um, microbiome or bacteria in the gut, the more likely we are to um, have a healthier body and immune system. Oh, another uh, word that's in the quotes there, detox, that I really just like, just because it's so misused. misused. Um, and really, the human body is so amazing. The liver and kidneys, the, the way they function um, to help us get rid of waste that we take in um, or detox um, are just amazing. And what they actually, what especially what the liver needs to do its job properly is good nutrition. So good nutrients. So just as an example, this is just an example I like to throw out, but um, for, a cu for a cup of coffee to change it into something that we can actually excrete. Um, so essentially that's what we call detox, right? Taking something in and then changing it into something that we can get rid of. Um, it takes magnesium four times in that pathway. So just one cup of coffee needs a lot of magnesium. Where do we get our magnesium from? Uh, I think of uh, greens. I think of uh, beans and lentils. Um, I think of nuts and seeds. And we, you know, as a, as a whole culture, we don't tend to focus on, on those foods very often. We don't tend to get them in as much. So just something to think about. What the body needs is not another fast. Um, unless you fast for religious purposes, I think that is in a separate category. Um, but what I'm talking about is when you do a fast for physiological purposes, um, it actually makes a lot more sense to fuel the body well so that the liver and kidney can just do what they're made to do and function. Oh, and try things outside of the box and things you might not try very often. Uh, we have a lot of amazing grains. Um, and yet in Canada, what we mostly focus on is wheat and it tends to be very processed. Um, you know, things like cereal and bread are very processed forms of wheat. So if you can try to think beyond the box or beyond the bread bag um, a little bit and experiment, not that those are bad foods by any means, but um, we just really have a, have a focus on them. Um, and there's other things like barley, um, oats, millet, uh, quinoa, brown rice, and there's so many more out there. Um, but these are good starters, I'd say. Fiber does have a number of different functions, which we already have touched on, that it does protect, protect um, against heart disease and certain types of cancers. And it can help us make, make us feel full. Everybody seems to be onto that regularity piece and it also can help stabilize our blood sugar. So yeah, just some general ideas about ways to boost your fiber intake. The Probably the best one is um, getting more fruits and vegetables, and we need to do that anyway. But a nice simple one I like to offer people, um, if you're having cereal in the morning or hot cereal, you could add just a tablespoon or two of bran, flaxseed, chia, or hemp hearts to your cereal in the morning or um, I also do like psyllium husk and it's not on the slide but that's a PSY psyllium and usually the best place to find that is in the bulk bins 
and it's very inexpensive and I would probably go with a teaspoon or two versus the tablespoon of the others because it's a lot of fiber. And then a, definitely a food group that's often overlooked in Canadian culture is those uh, beans, peas, and lentils, dried peas and beans. And they're great to add to, uh, they're quite versatile. You can add them to a lot of different things. So when, one of the ideas I like to use is just to boil up a batch of lentils and um, then I freeze them in my muffin tins. When they're frozen, I pop them out into a Ziploc bag and I just keep them. And whenever I make something, either with um, some, some ground beef or burger, um, if I make hamburgers, I can throw a little bit in, throw a little bit of uh, the lentils in, like I defrost them and throw them in there. Or I'll put them in sauces like spaghetti sauce or pizza sauce um, when I make soups. Or even if we have, sometimes we have a quick uh, store-bought soup we can throw that in and just make it a little healthier so they're quite versatile I would say most people wouldn't notice them in their dishes and um, really can also stretch your food budget a little bit too because the lentils tend to be very inexpensive especially the dried quite inexpensive and easy to find and whereas uh, beef is is more pricey so you can kind of stretch it and get it more nutrition out of it as well Sometimes people get a little confused around the terms probiotic and prebiotic. So probiotic is introducing the actual bacteria to the gut. So introducing those helpful strains of bacteria, whereas prebiotic is introducing the food that the bacteria will eat. Um, and as we sort of talked about before, um, the bacteria tends to like uh, fiber and that's so Generally speaking, when I think prebiotic, I think fiber. And if you, there is a lot of places to get probiotic, the actual bacteria in food. So things like yogurt, everybody seems to be onto that one, but kefir as well, which is a fermented milk product. Um, anytime there's fermented vegetables, like the store-bought sauerkraut that's refrigerated or um, kimchi or uh, if, if you know anybody who ferments vegetables from their garden, it's quite a simple process and that all contains probiotic in it. Um, so those are all really good sources. Kombucha as well, although some of the commercial, the store-bought products have a lot of sugar. So be careful about that. Um, but definitely kombucha is a source of, of bacteria. Um, if you do choose to do an over-the-counter probiotic, uh, there is a number of them out there. This website that's up on the screen right now, uh, probioticchart.ca, is actually an excellent resource. It's updated frequently, it's research-based, and it's got good information, and it's got Canadian information, uh, which is really helpful because we know there is some good, uh, there's been some good studies on probiotics. And sadly, um, 40 to 50 percent of the probiotics on the market aren't coated in a way that they'll survive the stomach. So they don't survive the acid of the stomach. So they're actually not getting to the low gut at all. So if we're gonna choose a probiotic and spend the money, um, I hope we're choosing something that will do actually give us some benefit. Of course, we can't actually know which, which bacteria is gonna grow in your soil, like which plant is gonna grow in your soil, because we have no way of telling what's in your soil right now and um, what it might be competing with but it's a bit of a guinea pig science for sure. But uh, um, unless you have immune issues um, in the very elderly or the very young, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lots of evidence to say there, there's no harm from probiotics. So um, worth giving it a try. And if you find one that, uh, that you like, uh, then that's helpful. So fruits and vegetables, so this is the old guideline. We actually have a new food guide and it doesn't have, um, it's not so much on the servings of, of food anymore, but I would say that there's enough research to say that eight to 10 fruits and vegetables servings um, is would be something to shoot for. And know that I know it's not realistic for everybody. If you're eating two, we're not gonna aim for eight <laughs> tomorrow. But um, if you're eating two, aiming for three is a great goal. Um, but eight to 10 um, servings of 
fruits and vegetables. I would say if, if we got most people up to that, we, we may um, see a big reduction in some of the health problems that we have going on. So it's a great place for people to focus. And uh, just keep in mind that little steps. Don't let that 8 to 10 um, daunt you or get in your way at all. So this is um, sort of a sad Canadian stat. Uh, You'll recall that, that we talked about 8 to 10 servings as being sort of the benchmark or the gold standard. And what we do know is that 40% of Canadians are getting their five servings of fruits and veg veggies. Um, <clears throat> so less than half of us are getting halfway there. So it's a little bit sad. So there's some definitely some room for improvement there. And, and, and every little bit will help. Some ideas for adding fruits and vegetables to your daily routine and little changes do make a big difference. Um, adding fruit to cereal or yogurt, adding a bit of greens to a smoothie you might make, having a salad on the side or some veggie sticks, keeping your veggies sliced and washed uh, in the fridge and ready to go if you are ever hungry or need a little snack. That, those little, th little things do make a big difference. So now we're uh, changing gears and talking about uh, fat. So we finished talking about our carbohydrates and we're turning now to, to fat. Um, and I like to say, turns out fat's not really the villain either. When I went to school, that was kind of the message. Um, I always get really uh, nervous when a nutrient is being villainized, whether it's currently it's carbohydrates, but um, if you go back a few years, it was fat and it does seem to go in cycles. But in truth, we need all the nutrients. Uh, we just need to keep them in balance. And some, probably in ideal situations, we need some more than others, but they all do have roles and um, necessary, uh, they are necessary for the human body. So uh, that's basically what it's saying here. Fat is necessary and essential in our diet. And um, we'll talk specifically about omega-3 fats. And we'll, I'll give you a caution about omega-6s in the diet as we go forward and we'll talk a little bit about choosing healthy fats. Fat can be found a lot of places in the diet. Uh, what first comes to mind typically is foods from animal or of animal origin, so that white trimming that you might find in your steak or pork chops or um, what we drain off of a hamburger or bacon, that white sort of marbling within it. Uh, but fat is also found in things like vegetable oil, uh, in nuts and seeds, uh, in avocado. So there's lots of it's there's a, a wide variety of places that it comes from in the diet. It provides a lot of energy. So bite per bite, more calories. Um, so that's kind of unique about fat. Um, typically in the food supply, I don't like to talk about anything as being good or bad, but we still actually have that verbiage when it comes to fat. So um, so I'll explain a little bit about how to choose healthier fat. So I'm going to speak to the bad fats or the saturated fats uh, first. And typically where you'll find these, I think of foods of animal origin um, with two exceptions, which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, I think that white marbling on your steak or pork chop, I think of um, what should drain off your ground beef or your bacon. Um, if you have deep fried foods like fried chicken or fried french fries, uh, butter is definitely a saturated fat. Um, saturated fats tend to be solid at room temperature, so um, that's a way to kind of tell as well. Uh, whole fat milks, whole fat dairy um, also would have a bit more of the saturated fat. So the two exceptions is uh, palm and coconut oil and they actually, the manufacturers do use that quite a bit. So it's worth um, taking a look at the label. So our, the reason saturated fat is a problem is because our bodies take that saturated fat and turn it into cholesterol in our blood. And the other bad guy, the ugly trans fats, um, unfortunately increase, increases our bad cholesterol and decreases our good cholesterol. So it's a bit of a double whammy there. Um, originally, when they found out how bad butter was for our arteries, 
uh, they tried to make something like canola or canola oil or olive oil into a spreadable product and they did that through a process called hydrogenation and the unfortunate consequence was that it created a chemical structure in the fat that our, our bodies just have never really seen before and it's a man-made fat so um, our body doesn't really know what to do with it and that's why we have this increase in the bad cholesterol and decreasing our good cholesterol so i typically think of where you would find um, trans fats is in hard margarines and shortenings and some you know anything commercially baked or prepared typically will have some trans fats uh, thankfully canada has some legislation in that where the marketplace will have to get its trans fats down to zero i believe it's within the next three years so you will see that uh, happening uh, at the at the purchase points or growth grocery stores the good news the good guys um, there are lots of good fats out there <clears throat> that we want to get a little bit of. So um, things like olive oil, canola oil, um, you see the peanut oil here, avocados, and then nuts and seeds. Um, so there's a few examples there for you. Of course, um, trying to get more of those omega-3 specifically. Omega-3 is an unsaturated fat. Uh, so those fatty fish for heart health. So the salmon, the herring, sardines, all fat is, all, all fish is good for our heart health though. Um, but um, the fattier the fish gives us more of those good fats. So I hear a lot of people saying they don't like fish. Um, and I always laugh at this slide because I think if you don't like fish, what are the chances you'll like kelp and seaweed? Um, but your other options are things like fortified foods. So they do have a, um, eggs and margarine that are fortified with the omega-3s in them. And then the plant sources of omega-3s, um, we can get this through ground flax and flax oil, walnut and walnut oil, or our chia seeds or canola oil have a little bit of omega-3. As I mentioned off the top, I was just going to give you uh, caution about the omega-6 so it is also an unsaturated fat so sometimes we may think oh yeah, that's good for us it's an unsaturated fat and in some respects you'd be right so if we do keep our omega-6s so that we have two omega-6 to one omega-3 then it's very healthy um, but what happens if, if that that omega-6 ratio gets a little higher sneaks a little higher uh, they don't they use different pathways and the pathways they use can be inflammatory to us so we just want to be careful because we use omega-6 a lot in the marketplace um, anything that's in a package or bag or box or salad dressing is a big one uh, we've found out you know we don't want to have so much saturated fat we don't want to have so much trans fat omega-3s aren't shelf stable so often the the go-to is omega-6s so just be really careful about that the average canadian has 13 omega-6 to omega-1 so i mean omega-3 pardon me <laughs> to one omega-3 so we just want to be careful about keeping keeping that ratio um up to the two to one so we do find it in some of the foods that are listed here, but I find it's not so much a concern in something like sunflower oil or the pecans as it is more of those prepared meals. Um, probably the biggest source of omega-6s in our diet is salad dressing. And definitely if you're taking an omega-3, 6, 9, there's no need for the 6, 9, just take the omega-3. Oh, and I get this question all the time in class. What's the deal with eggs? Should we have them? Should we not have them? <laughs> so um, eggs have dietary cholesterol. So people think, well, eggs have cholesterol and I don't want more cholesterol in my body, so I shouldn't have eggs. But the fact of it is, is that dietary cholesterol, cholesterol we take in from food, um, our body takes that and turns it or turns it into other things. So dietary cholesterol can be a precursor to vitamin D, for example. So most of the dietary cholesterol we take in is turned into something else. So it has a very little um, negligible effect on our heart health and our cholesterol. I would say there's no need to uh, avoid eggs um, for, the, for the general population. People always want a guideline. I would say, you know, probably eight, eight yolks a week. Um, 
over and above that, then there might be a problem. Um, and if you do have a really strong heart history, then we might wanna limit those yolks to four. Still quite a bit more than I think the average person is doing. And the bottom line in fat is choose the fat wisely. Try to keep your total fat intake low because like we said, bite per bite, it does pack a lot of energy. Um, being really careful with those saturated and trans fats and include a, you know, unsaturated fat or those good fats like we talked about. The other thing, one thing we can add that um, might even help is an increase in soluble fiber or fiber in general, because like we said, it's like a, like a scrub brush going through the body and just cleaning it out as it goes. Oh, and then we're turning over to protein now. So we've already finished carbohydrate and fat and we're on to protein. So just like the other nutrients, it's got a lot of functions in the body. Uh, people do seem to associate protein with building muscle, so that's known and out there. It also has functions um, in some of our hormones. It can help, just like fiber does, in um, keeping our blood glucose um, sort of more stable so they're not, it's not going up and down. And that's just a function of when we eat something with protein in it, even if there's some carbohydrate, um, it, it takes a little longer to digest and then therefore is leaving the stomach a little slower. So going into the blood sugar a little slower instead of spiking up and down. So yeah, definitely proteins and like the building blocks of the body. So it helps build, maintain and repair your body. Um, I don't know, I already said this about blood sugar levels. <laughs> So where we find protein, I again, always think of foods of animal origins. So I think meat, fish, poultry, um, but definitely there's lots of vegetarian alternatives. Um, and there, uh, as we saw in the food guide, um, there's lots of options there. Um, and, and it's sort of focusing on the plant-based proteins. So things like beans, lentils, nuts, and seeds, or soy-based products like tofu. And now moving on to vitamins and minerals. Uh, so we've talked about protein, fat, carbohydrates. You can think of those like logs on your fire and the vitamins and minerals we get from our foods, from our essentially from our fruits and our vegetables and our B vitamins from our grains um, and other sources of vitamins and minerals. Um, they're like our spark or our match. So sometimes all the right logs can be there, um, but we just have no way to burn the energy. We don't have the right vitamins and minerals. So getting a variety is really important. And very often in class, people ask me if they should supplement. And I would say the literature says if you're eating a healthy diet, that there's no need to supplement. Um, there is one exception that we all agree on is that women in their childbearing years should be taking folic acid. Um, I don't think there's any harm in taking a, a balanced multivite um, if people choose to do that. And then, of course, if you are in your childbearing years, the folic acid is in there as well. Water. Um, there's a few quotes on drinking water. This is one place where I think people are actually changing and doing really well for the most part. Um, we just realize that water does, well, basically it takes everything, all the stuff we just talked about takes everything where it needs to go and it takes all the waste away. So um, yeah, I really like the quote about pure water is the world's, world's first and foremost medicine. So um, it's a good one. Hydration is very important. I think most people are uh, catching on to this one. I see most of the time when people are out and about, they're carrying their water bottles. Um, how much? So often when I ask this in class, they get the answers of 8, 10, 12 cups. Uh, really, there's not a lot of research to support those uh, cups or how much water, but um, to use as an indicator of how well hydrated we are, just looking at the color of our urine and is it very pale um, and see-through-y, um, and that's a better indicator of how much. But I don't think um, 8, 10, 12 cups is a bad um, goal to aim for. Uh, definitely the research and hydration would say if you're thirsty, it's too late. So we wanna kind of be proactive and uh, get some water in. So, and just a reminder to make healthy drink choices because it's really easy to drink um, a lot of calories in one sitting. Uh, and uh, it, they're, it's not really that feeling like if you ate the same caloric intake of food, so.
careful. You're sweet enough. Choose milk or water is what I always say. Uh, healthy eating, uh, the basics. So these are just guidelines. Um, there's an exception to every rule, and these aren't necessarily rules, like I said. But uh, for some people, I do find that things go off the rails because they haven't fueled the early day well. So I recommend to try to eat within two hours of waking. Lots of people say they don't feel well when they get up in the morning, and there's always some flexibility here, but that is something to think about anyway. Um, I like to encourage people not to go more than four hours without a meal or snack. Uh, the body does best when it's when it falls under patterns, and then when and also when it doesn't sense deprivation or like there's not enough. So with anything else in health, the key is just balance. Um, I like to give the recommendation of three to four food groups at meals, and that's as simple as well. If I always have Cheerios and milk in the morning. Maybe I'll add a banana to it, so I'm not adding another food group in. Um, and if my snack is always almonds, maybe I have some blueberries and my almond, or I have some yogurt and fruit, or some hummus and veggies. Uh, just thinking about maybe two, two different kinds of foods at your snacks. Uh, so common things we, and I, by we I mean sort of us at the PCN here, uh, but definitely me, I can talk for myself for sure, uh, no breakfast, skipping meals, uh, people low on water, but I would say this is one of the ones that people are really picking up on and doing a lot better with um, most of the time. A low fruits and vegetables definitely across the board I would say and low on fiber so I always like people to focus on positive changes um, and not what they shouldn't do um, if that doesn't make any sense um, I like people to focus on so say they want to um, you know not drink so much coffee instead of saying I shouldn't drink coffee I shouldn't drink coffee I just focus them on what's the healthy behavior they want to attract in and say water is the what they'd like to get more of so we focus on okay we had I have five glasses of water right now I'm going to aim for seven um, and see if maybe that behavior that you don't want will slide off a little bit um, if we're focusing on something like I shouldn't have chocolate, I shouldn't have chocolate all day long, I shouldn't have chocolate, I shouldn't have ice cream, what have I thought about all day? I've thought about chocolate and ice cream. And we are, when we do that, we when we thought about something all day, we are way more likely to indulge and then overindulge. And it's not uncommon for people to say, instead of having a small portion of ice cream, I ate half a pint. I just really lost control. And that's that's when we've given the food too much power. So just remember to keep it simple. Like we said, three to four food groups at meals, two at snacks. Try that guideline of having a fruit or vegetable with every meal or snack. Uh, the mindful eating messages I really like. So take your time to eat. Stop working to eat. Um, have some breakfast. Uh, savor, savor your food and savor and enjoy your food. So yeah, uh, grab and go snacks. These are just things that people have said over the years that they would include in their snacks, things that can grab and go. I love to um, encourage the direction of fruits and veggies just because I know we, um, as a culture, we're quite low, especially Canada is quite low and then Alberta is quite low. So um, yeah, it's just a good place to focus there. So have something with you in case things go a little sideways. You can just have a uh, drinks. I always say you're sweet enough. Choose water or milk. Um, so I always like to explain this a little bit. If you have a drink that you have once or twice a year or very infrequently and it's your favorite and it just is something you really enjoy, I would say do not worry about the nutrition. Just really enjoy it and savor it. Um, but if you have a habit that's sort of, you know, every other day, um, or a daily uh, of a sweet drink, I would be checking the nutrition on it and seeing what's in there. Um, those specialty beverages, um, like the coffees, uh, hot drinks, those kinds of things, and even some of the beverages you can buy um, at the convenience store, um, sometimes they're between 500 and 1,000 calories. 
and I'm not, I'm not a calorie counter, but it just gives us a measure of energy to say, whoa, you know, <laughs> that's a lot of my day's total energy. Um, you know, say you were shooting for 1500 and you had a drink that was a thousand calories. That's really taken up a, a good portion of that. So yeah, if it's an everyday habit, become a label reader and ask some questions. But um, if it's like, I have this drink once at Christmas, then go ahead, enjoy it. To do any more research. Um, ways just to, you know, things, healthy drinks and ways we can make them more exciting. Use those fresh uh, lime slices, lemon, um, to to flavor the water. Some people have talked about freezing, you know, strawberries or grapes and having it in a diffuser or in the water. Keep your water bottle with you. If it's not with you, you, you won't have it. So um, some people like it cold in the fridge. Some people like to keep it at room temperature. So you can kind of play around with the temperatures. Maybe you add a splash of juice. Um, some people really like that carbonation in sparkling water. And if you do choose a sugar-sweetened beverages, beverage, whatever it is, look for the smaller size. Although I see everything seems to be getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Like a Slurpee now, um, it seems like even the small is quite large. <laughs> so yeah, just be careful there because it, again, it's easy to drink our day's worth of calories just in sugar-sweetened beverages. In my practice, I've really tried to get away from a lot of weighing and measuring and really controlling food but it is I'd be remiss if I didn't mention portions at all um, definitely our plates and bowls have gotten bigger it's it's easier to get more than we need um, here's just a few examples of like the restaurant and the restaurant popcorn uh, the movie popcorn or how a bagel is grown from it used to be the size of a hockey puck and now it's the size of a your your face or a ring at ring they're quite large and even you know things like cheeseburgers have grown quite a bit definitely our pop and slurpees the portions have gotten bigger and bigger um, so just something to be wary of and this what I like to keep I really do like to come back to that plate method um, where we talked about the Canada food guide and really if you have half your plate filled with fruits and vegetables um, I'm not so very concerned about what's on the other side of the plate so um, we're just filling up and we're balancing with good choices there I think it's always good to remember that it's just food and don't let it have so much power. And what I mean by that is if you have a food that you have trouble having in the house and you just feel like you can't control yourself around it, that's when we've let that, let that food have too much power over us. And so I find that that is very much because of diet culture and because talent our message to ourself that that's a bad food and no, I shouldn't, um, has created those kinds of relationships. So usually it's not the kind of thing we can solve overnight, but I often find just bringing people's own awareness to themselves and their own behaviors, they can start to change them. So that's what I'm hoping is just to bring a little awareness to that. And so now uh, we'll turn to talking about the nutrition label and how I find the nutrition label the most helpful. I find it isn't very helpful when you just pick up a product and say to yourself, is this a good choice or not so good choice for me? Um, what I, where I find it's more helpful is if you're comparing two products. So if you're comparing two different yogurts, say, or two different crackers, um, it can be helpful in this way. Um, the nutrient label can help us uh, give us some information on whether there's a lot or a little of a, of a specific nutrient, and we use the percentage daily value to do that, and I'll show you that. Um, or maybe we have a special diet reason, that say we're diabetic and we're looking for a certain number of carbohydrates. We can use the label for that reason. Um, and just, you know, there is some information on there. It's good to be mindful of what we're putting in and um, we can make best use of the label. Look at. So the parts of the label we're going to talk about, there's four of them. There's a nutrition facts label, there's the ingredient list, um, nutrition claims and health claims, which I find less helpful and I'll explain why in just a minute. So reading the label, that is what the label looks like. Um, 
the first thing I always look at when reading the label is the serving size to make sure that I'm comparing apples to apples. So I don't want to be, be, be comparing um, a half cup of yogurt to three quarters of a cup because that's quite different. Um, these things that are at the top of the nutrition labels, calories, fat, cholesterol, sodium, carbohydrate, protein, those will always be on your nutrition label. So I find the percentage daily value can be more helpful if you don't, most of us don't know when we see grams of something, is that a lot or is it a little? So the percentage daily value column can be really helpful. So that's the column on the far side. So just so you know, that column is, is the reference they use is uh, 2000 calories or the calories for an average male. So it's not 100% accurate for each individual person, but it can be helpful. So if we see 5% or less of something, that's a little, or 15% or more, we know there's lots of that. So things you might want a little of, or things like sodium, um, you may want little sugar, uh, things we want a lot of, usually those are things like calcium, maybe you're looking for, you know, higher iron, um, more protein, more vitamin C perhaps. Um, yeah, so that's how you can use that for daily value. And then the ingredient list, I think people are really smart about this. Ingredients are listed uh, by weight from the most to the least. So the first few items on an ingredient list will be what's most in, in a product. So um, for this one is whole grain rolled oats, uh, sugar, high monounsaturated canola oil, which just means canola oil, basically, um, almond pieces. So this looks like a granola bar and um, there is gonna be quite high sugar in there. Um, and it's actually in here and syrup. So yeah, it's gonna be quite a sweet product just from looking at the ingredient list, you can tell that. Nutrition claims, um, they are regulated statements and they are true. I just find sometimes they can be misleading. So the peaches is a good example that they're a good source of vitamin C. All peaches would be a good source of vitamin C and actually most of the fruit are good sources of vitamin C. So it's just maybe a little bit deceiving. Uh, yeah, for sure peaches are, but you shouldn't choose peaches over say strawberries because um, they both are great sources of vitamin C. And nutrition claims example. So um, I, t I tend to not mind the ones that are on the right here, the source, the high source, higher good source or very higher excellent source, especially for certain nutrients. Like if I'm looking for fiber or calcium or um, yeah, fiber or calcium might be something I'm looking for. That usually if you're looking for fiber, a source means it's two grams of fiber, a high source is four, very high is five or five or higher. So that is helpful to know about a product. I find these less helpful. These on the on the left side here, free, uh, um, low, low fat, reduced, and light. And the two that I find most troublesome are reduced and light. Um, reduced 25% less of a nutrient compared with a similar product, but we don't really know what they're comparing it to. Um, so I just find it's really not all that helpful. Light can be used to mean light in calories, but it also can be light in color or light in weight. So that one is one that I see misused all the time. Then the health claims, again, these are true claims, uh, but uh, just a little bit deceiving because it's not only that product that would apply to these health claims. So this one, for example, is a healthy diet, low in saturated and trans fat may reduce the risk of heart disease. Um, naming the food, so say Cheerios is free of saturated and trans fats. Um, so yeah, it's a true statement. I don't think it's harmful for it to be on the package. Uh, just likely um, a similar product would carry the same claim. So general health claims are developed by third parties, just so you know. Um, it's not something that Health Canada creates or anything like that. So um, I would definitely not rely on them to make informed food choices. Yeah, so use the nutrition facts, the ingredient list and nutrition claims to, to make informed food choices. Um, nutrition facts are based on a specific amount of food. 
Um, so compare it to the amount you actually eat. And that's actually something I should have mentioned when I was talking about the serving size. So if you know you usually have 40 crackers, um, it, don't think by looking at the nutrition label and it says 10 crackers that you know what you're taking in, right? You'd have to multiply that by four. So yeah, just compare it to the amount you'd actually eat. And the percentage daily value can be really helpful. I think it's one of the most helpful things on the label, as long as we don't take it too um, strictly and just think 5% or less is a little and 15% or more is a lot. Oh. So this is just an opportunity to compare uh, different nutrition labels. So Cracker A and Cracker B. So the first thing we do, like we said, is look up here um, at the serving size. And um, the Cracker A has nine crackers, whereas Cracker B has four crackers. And um, But they're both around 20-ish grams. So I would say those are comparable. And then you might, it depends what you want. Sometimes people will have different answers on what the choice is for them based on, on what they're looking for for their health goals. Uh, but this Cracker A does have quite a bit more sodium than Cracker B. Cracker B has quite a bit more fiber. So in this example, I'd say it's pretty clear Cracker B is the choice, but it would all come down to taste, right? Because I don't want to eat something that tastes like a piece of cardboard, so... Yeah, and that's just explaining things that we'd want less of, like fat, saturated fat, and sodium, and then what we'd want that 15% or more of fiber, vitamin A, calcium, or iron. And that brings us to my favorite topic, which is mindful eating. And the simplest definition of that I know of mindful eating is just paying attention on purpose to what we eat. Um, so being very purposeful with what we eat, having some intention um, and some awareness around the foods that we're putting in. A lot of times if I ask people what they think when I say mindful eating, uh, they'll say it brings to mind a time when they ate mindlessly. So they grabbed a bag of chips from the pantry, they sat in front of the TV and they were munching away before they knew it, their hand was scraping the bottom of the bag and they didn't even remember tasting them or enjoying them. So that is mindless eating, which is the opposite. We want the polar opposite of that, being really mindful when we eat. And it can be very simple in, in theory, but a little more difficult to practice. And I think practice is a really good word because it tends to be a skill that doesn't come overnight, but is a continual practice in our way of being. And really what we want to tune in Two is our own cues of hunger, and instead of fullness, almost um, being comfortably satisfied with what we've eaten. Um, so eating when we're hungry and stopping when we're comfortably full. I am so passionate about mindful eating because I find that um, probably more than any other strategies that I've used in my career, it's helped people really create a better relationship with food and eating. Um, and just a lot of people have become healthier and happier as a result of trying some of the concepts. And I do have a class, like I mentioned, in mindful eating um, that we're going to have available online. Uh, so take a click around our YouTube channel and see if you can find it there. What's, looking, what's working better? Living vibrantly. Uh, so this is the idea of just using the fuel that we've consumed to live vibrantly. Uh, perhaps we find an activity we enjoy and just stick with it. Um, I always feel concerned when people are on the treadmill and saying, I'm doing this, but I hate it. If you find something you really like, um, you're so much more likely to stick with it. We can also uh, fit activities into our our every day so the idea of like parking a little farther away or taking the stairs um, every little bit helps so um, breaking things into smaller chunks makes really good sense um, you know the the guideline is for 30 minutes but there's nothing to say we can't start with five minutes and if we put a few little five minute breaks in our day maybe three five minute breaks that adds up to 15 minutes um, that's really fantastic and wonderful. So start with just one small thing.
yeah, so some examples at the bottom there, taking the stairs, like we said, um, lifting soup cans, uh, maybe just do a walkabout on the commercials, or um, it could be any little thing. Every little bit counts. So SMART goals, I know a lot of industries use them, and people, very often a number of our participants will be familiar with SMART goals. Um, SMART's just an acronym that stands for specific, measurable, achievable. This slide says rewarding, but I all I often use realistic um, and time frame. So it has a time frame attached. So what we find with goals is people are like, yeah, I want to eat healthier. That's my goal. But it's a very like a broad goal. And what we want to do is kind of kind of boil it down um, and make it more specific. So um, this is an example, like I will eat breakfast, including three food groups, three days this week. Um, and I will shop on the weekend and start on Monday. So you have a starting time, you kind of have an action plan on what you do to start your goal. Um, notice it's not seven days a week, it's a doable, realistic number. Um, the more specific we are, the better with our goals. So I hope you were able to identify one and at the most two, but I'd like to encourage you just to pick one really small change uh, that you can make your SMART get goal for. And I know um, you, that feels like something small and like, oh, it doesn't feel like I'm doing much. But I just want to draw your attention to the analogy of water. So water is really soft and yielding and it just goes around things. Um, but over time has the power to change landscapes. And that's kind of what we want to impart to you. Um, just, just a small change, but something you can live with and stick with. And then when that feels just like life and just what you do, then we move on to the next thing. Um, and just that reminder there at the bottom, think about a just noticeable difference. So you don't have to change much. Um, if you know you always over portion potatoes, two bites less. Um, if you're not active at all right now, a five or 10 minute walk after dinner, just a small, small change that you're even, if you feel like, <laughs> doesn't feel like I'm doing a whole lot, then that's probably a good change for you. So to summarize, we talked about the nutrients. We talked about carbohydrate, fat, and protein. And then we talked about the vitamins and minerals, of course, importance of hydration, I gave you a few healthy eating basics about balanced meals and proper portions. We touched on label reading and then we ended off with a little bit on um, living vibrantly or activity and our SMART goals. So I just wanted to thank you so much for joining me. I really hope you got something out of that that will help you a little tidbit, tidbit that might help you on your health journey. Um, I'm Kathy, the dietitian with the Highland Primary Care Network, and just want to invite you to check out our YouTube page. We have other classes and offerings there, and also we do have a Facebook page. So if you type in um, Highland Primary Care, the whole thing, um, Highland Primary Care Network, um, we do have a Facebook page for you to, we do have other offerings um, that we put out there as well. So um, thank you again for joining me and take good care. Bye-bye.